שבוע טוב. פרשס ויחי. Almost a hundred pages in the Zohar. And the kind of a parsha that you cannot leave. In other words, if you're going to sit down and if you're going to study, you're going to have to do that without walking away from it because there is just simply so, so much involved that you can't possibly not continue. But it's difficult because here we have a Parsha where we lose our patriarch Yaakov and we also lose Yosef. And it's the last Parsha in the book of Genesis. And after death, we say, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak. Be strong, be strong, and be strengthened. There is so much in here to talk about. And things that normally you would not talk about. And this is called death. But before we talk about death, let's talk about basically what goes on here and why this is so incredibly important. Yaakov understands that his time has come and it's time for him to bless his sons. And it's time for him to bless Yosef's two sons, Menachshe and Ephraim. And here comes an interesting conversation because where is it written that Yosef is married to Potiphar's daughter, Asnat. But where is it written that she converted? Where is it written that she is Jewish? Where is it written that Menashe and Ephraim are Jews? And Yaakov takes them, both of them, and he blesses them and he gives them part of the land. I was looking and I couldn't find where it was written that she had converted. What is written is that there is actually a contract that is produced by Yosef where he shows that these are his children from his marriage. And this was something that was in that time not done. There was no piece of gold. There was no ring. There was basically a ceremony and, you know, Yitzhak took Rachel. He took, sorry, took Rivka. He took her into his mother's tent and that was the end of that. Here, there is actually conversation of who are these kids? And Yaakov says, they are mine. And he produces 
documents. And the children get the blessings. Not exactly the way Yaakov thought that that was going to be because he chooses one and Yosef says, no, 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 that's not the one. He is not the firstborn. But Yaakov says, also, he will be great, but this is the one, Ephraim, who is going to get the blessing of the firstborn. And he goes through, and this you can read, of course, in the Chumash, and he goes through the entire conversation of each and every one of his sons, what they did, why they did, how they did, why they're getting the blessings that they're getting, and you can understand from these blessings that Yaakov is aware of everyone's shortcomings, everyone's greatness, and he discusses what the blessing and his blessing means. There's also conversation, very, very deep conversation in the Zohar, of what is death. How does death evolve? And what do we receive? And how do we receive the conversation of death? When somebody dies, it's a very difficult thing for, it doesn't matter who it is. If you're very close to the person, you feel an extreme loss. And this loss is our loss. It's not the loss of the Nishama. It's our loss because part of us, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, whom we love, whom we care about, has gone away and left us. On the other hand, the neshama of this person, the ruach of this person, the spirit of this person, is liberated from the body that has held it back and is able now to reconnect with its source. Reconnecting with its source but also going through a tremendous amount of cleaning, let's say, until we get, until the Nishama gets to where she has to go. I think it's extremely important to know about this. And I'm going to talk about something that maybe you're not going to hear around so often because it's not something that people talk about here 
we will talk about it. And that is the actual burying. Because in this partial, we have two. We have the conversation of um, we have the conversation of Yaakov basically pulls up his feet and he dies. And then before, obviously, he told Yosef, do not let me stay in this place. Bring me to the Machpelah where I need to join my forefathers. And he, we, he is the last one that will be buried with Adam and Eve, Avram and Sarah, and Yaakov and Leah. These are the Nishamas that are in Machpelah. There are many conversations amongst the people when they die or before they die, obviously, where are they going to be buried? And the idea of dying outside of Israel and the idea of being buried in Israel is a very great problematic because the Zohar says we have a dictum that if a man dies in foreign soil and if his body is buried in the Holy Land, to him may be applied the verse, and ye came and defiled my land and my inheritance, you made an abomination. How then could Yaakov ask to be buried in the grave of his fathers, seeing that he was dying an alien soil. And Rabbi Yudha said, Yaakov was different because the Shechina was closely attached to him. Hence it is written, I will go down with thee to Egypt to, wed, to abide with thee in captivity and I will also surely bring thee up again to attach my soul, thy soul to me, and to obtain burial for thy body in the graves of thy father, and this even though he departed life on alien soul. He was further promised that Joseph should put his hand on his eye the reason being that God knew that he was the first born in intent and that he was most attached to Joseph. Two important things here. Number one, not everyone except a grade of Joseph, Yaakov, Yitzchak. In other words, we're talking about tzaddikim. We're talking about patriarchs. We're not talking about 
my father. We're talking about the father of our people can be buried in the land of Israel because and ye came and defiled my land and my inheritance you made an abomination is once the body has died on foreign soil and the neshama has left the body, the body is completely tuma. And when you bring tuma into the holy earth of Eretz Israel, you are defiling the land. This is a major, very, very big concept that very few people talk about, that is not something that we want to hear, because even if we die in Chutzlaret, we want to be buried in Israel. That is not so, that is not permissible, that is not allowed, because it is Tuma, it is an abomination, and it is reserved only for tzaddikim. In other words, if there is, God forbid, something horrible that happened in Paris, in Berlin, in Marseille, where there are Jewish martyrs, and they are brought back to be buried in Eretz Israel. That is the same grade as a tzaddik or somebody who lives in Eretz Israel. And then, on the regular, this is permitted. But only then. I know that, and I've gone through this with my parents. I wanted my parents to be buried in Israel. And for years I argued with my mother about burying my father in Israel because that's what he wanted. She never gave permission. And she herself wanted to be next to my father. So there was no way that I could bring my parents to Eretz Israel. I didn't know. When I started to study years ago, and when I came across this particular conversation, I began to realize that Hashem actually protected the Nishamas from defilement and the Guf from defiling the earth. And I became very happy because I realized that this was correct. Again, God knew and what he promised to Joseph and what he promised to Yaakov would be fulfilled. Yosef said before he died, take out my bones, bring my bones to Eretz Israel. And the promise was fulfilled. Baruch Hashem. I'm now going to talk to you about something else 
and I'm going to read you directly from the Zohar, from this Parsha, something that, again, I'm sure you've not heard before. And this is the conversation of putting one's hands on the eyes of a departed. This is done, if God permits a firstborn son to do this to his father. What was the idea of this promise of putting his hands on his eyes? Rabbi Yosef said that it was a sign of honor to Jacob and to inform him that Yosef was alive and would be with him at his death. Said Rabbi Heskia, I have learned something which is hardly like to disclose showing how wisdom is embodied in a common practice. Speak out, speak out, do not be afraid. In the days of Rabbi Shimon, there is no need for secrecy. And he said, I have seen in the chapter of Rabbi Jesse the Elder regarding customs that if a man has a son when he dies, his son ought to put dust on his eyes at the time of his burial, and this is a mark of respect to him, being a sign that the world is now concealed for him, but his son inherits the world in his place. For the human eye represents the world with its various colors, the outer ring of white corresponds to the sea of Oceanus, which surrounds the whole world. The next color represents the land, which is surrounded by the sea. A third color in the middle of the eye corresponds to Jerusalem, which is the center of the world. Finally, there is the pupil of the eye, which reflects the beholder and is the most perilous part of all. This corresponds to Zion, which is the central point of the universe in which the reflection of the whole world can be seen and where is the abode of the Shekhinah, which is the beauty and the signature of the world. Thus, the eye is the heritage of the world, and so as the father leaves it, the son inherits it. Says Rabbi Abba, you are quite right, but there is still a deeper significance in the practice, although men do not know it. For when a man departs from the world, his soul is still enclosed in him. And before his eyes are closed, they see certain recondite things, as we have explained in connection with the verse, for a man shall not see me and live, indicating that they see things in their death, which they do not see in their lifetime then it behooves those who are present to place their hands on his eyes and close them. And as we have learned in connection with customs and manners, if he has a son, it behooves the son in the first place to do so as it is written and Joseph shall put his hands on thine eyes.
The reason for closing the eyes is because some sight in reverse of holy might present itself. And it is not so meet that the eye, which has just beheld the holy vision, should now dwell on the sight of a different character. A further reason is that the soul is still attached to him in the house. And if the eye is left open, which with that unholy vision still resting on it, everything it looks upon is cursed. And this is not respectful to the eye to allow it to gaze upon anything improper. The best sign of respect, therefore, is that a man's eyes should be closed by the hand of a son whom he was left behind. <sighs> Difficult things to talk about. Difficult things to hear and difficult things to do. And if it happens to be a daughter and it happens to be a mother, I was present at the death of my mother. I was with my mother through her final struggles and I saw death and I closed my mother's eyes and I saw the vision of her eyes in the last moments of her life and I will never ever ever forget it. The schus of being, the privilege of being with somebody at the moment of their soul departing is something unforgettable and marks our life. Obviously, in Yaakov's case, he was embalmed and taken then with great procession to the Machpelah and in turn there with Leah. And there is a moment between Yosef and Yaakov where Yaakov says to Yosef I know that in your heart you are not happy with me that I buried your mother not at the Machpelah that I buried her on the way to Bethlehem. Don't hold it against me in your heart because it was Hashem that told me to do that because and the voice is heard in Ramah. It's the voice of Rachel crying for her children. It was already known to Yaakov that the children after the destruction of the temple would pass and they would pray and Rachel would hear and Rachel would cry for the children 
who are being sent into exile. And Yosef never brought it up to his father. But he knew. And before he died, he wanted to clean it up, so to speak. And basically, that's what he did with all of his sons. There is no conversation here of blessing Dina. And that's something that's very interesting and I really need to find an answer for that. Um, there's also a big conversation in my mind about heredity. What is it that parents leave for their children and children leave for their children? And this is the great conversation of education, of learning of giving to our children the inheritance of who they are, what they are, who we are. This is the most important conversation of the Jewish people. And that is our legacy. That is our heritage. That is what has held us, what has kept us, what has given us survival, survival, our life as Jewish people our survival through all of the horror of the world that has come upon us. And we've survived. We've survived because of Torah. We've survived because of Hashem giving us Torah, our parents teaching us Torah, our tzaddikim being there and upholding Torah, the word of Hashem with us constantly and forever. Today, Seventy nations are going to meet in Paris. The seventy nations of Gog and Magog are going to vote to destroy Eretz Israel. But that is not going to happen. And I bear no fear. You know, why? Because I know that we are in the time of Mashiach. We are in the time of redemption. We are at the moment. We are at the moment where at the end of this Parsha, Rabbi Shimon says, and thy people are all righteous. They shall forever inherit the land, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified 
Those are the last words of Parsha's Vayichi. And this is the way it is going to be. Because Yaakov lives. Yaakov did not die. Yaakov was gathered to his people. Yaakov was the essence, the epitome of what is a Jewish neshama. There is no death. There is bombing, there is oil, there is everything at that time was done properly in order for Yaakov to remain. But that's not why Yaakov remains. He remains because his neshama, his ruach, remains as alive today as he was then. He suffered so much all of his life. The last 17 years in Chutzaret, in Egypt, being with his son, having his family together, seeing his children live in luxury in Goshen, but knowing that exile will come and the Shekhinah leaving him for the moment where he discloses or where he would disclose the arrival of Mashiach. But he couldn't. He couldn't speak. Because had he spoken, and the children would have realized what a long exile that they would have, it would give them Agmat Nefesh. It would give them pain. And so the Shekhinah departed, he couldn't speak, but returned to him for the blessings that he had to give to each one of the tribes. We're in the time of redemption. The Lubavitch Rebbe died but lives. He is the forerunner to Mashiach, just like Moshe Rabbeinu, just like Yaakov Avinu, just like every one of our great tzaddikim, Rabbi Shimon, we're talking about Zohar, the knowledge of Torah, the depth of Torah, the discussion of the conceptual things that are depth beyond depth that most of us don't know, don't understand, don't have any comprehension, but here it is written, open, Learn, understand, conceive, perceive that we are in the time of redemption and the schus, the privilege we have 
to know. And thy people are righteous. They shall forever inherit the land, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. And although he died on foreign soil, his soul was united with the Shekhinah, the reason being that he was righteous, and every righteous one inherits the celestial holy land. My friends, Chabrim, Yiddish mention the idea of being a Jew, the idea of having Torah and Hashem. Don't fear because no matter where you are, no matter where you go, no matter where Hashem sends you, you are part of this land, your land, your God gives you the schus to return. Return in life and take part of. But even if you are there, wherever, know that being there is a shlichut, being an emissary of your people. No matter where you are in this world, be the Jew. Be the righteous. Be who Hashem wants you to be. And let Torah guide your life. To Mashiach. To redemption. Immediately. Now, Amen, Amen.